Brandon Miller competes in All-Star Weekend. What do we think of his outing in the Riding Stars Challenge? We'll start to talk about some of these general manager candidates for the Charlotte Hornets. Mike Gansey up today, a part of the Cleveland Cavaliers organization. Then we'll just give you our All-Star break takes in general. All today, Locked On Hornets. You are Locked On Hornets, your daily Charlotte Hornets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Uh, in a minute, cuz we live. We live. <laughs> It's Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. We appreciate you making us your first listen. You can catch us anywhere you get your podcasts, and that includes YouTube. There's Doug Danson on a Monday. You can find his work on his Substack, every hornetsboxscore.com. And I'm Walker Mail. You can listen to me on WFNZ every weekday from 12 to 3 p.m. Wesson Walker, Sports Radio 92.7 FM. We got to see the All-Star Weekend. We got to see Brandon Miller participate. And I saw a couple of tweets some thoughts from Hornets Twitter rolling in saying this is going to be the night that Brandon Miller shows the world what he's made of. Everybody, everybody's going to know today. And then Brandon Miller stat line afterwards. Zero points. Okay. A uh, goose egg. Um, okay. Inefficient shooting. Uh, oh, of four. Oh, of two from three. Got a couple rebounds, got a couple steals, even had a block. So we know that the defense is there. We've seen the blocks before, but uh, we didn't really see the offensive game on display. Um, to be fair to Brandon, Doug, just like a lot of other stars up in Naptown this weekend, it seemed like he cared a whole lot. You know what? All right. Hopefully, you just reserve that care for winning here with the Charlotte Hornets. Well, and it's clear, I think, from his statements at All-Star Weekend that that's where his priorities lie. And I I feel like he wanted to make that known, <laughs> and he certainly yeah. did. <laughs> With the performance, I mean, there was a little bit of lax, like I'm not I'm not totally engaged in this game. And unfortunately, it came in a game against these like G League all stars. I called them team tryhards because that's where they were. That's what they were. And I don't know how these teams were selected necessarily, if it was just straight up pool of players and there was like a draft, because there were four teams and the G League All Star team was drafted by Detlef Schrempf. And if it was just a straight up draft, then Detlef was like galaxy braining the whole thing by picking a bunch mm-hmm. of G League guys because, you know, they're all there. They're they're in a, on a big stage and they like appreciate that fact, and they and they play like it. They were all engaged, and you know, Brandon was teamed up with Wimby and a lot of other guys that have that have bigger priorities than you know. They have playoff aspirations someday. They have championship aspirations. So no one's trying to like hit the floor and go after a loose ball and like blow a knee out or anything. And so they were certainly playing like that. And so like one part of me is like, man, I wish I wish he did care because you never know if you're going to get back, honestly. Like that I I, I don't understand and this goes sort of for the All-Star game too. I don't really understand this mentality of like, well, it's just the All-Star weekend. It's it's just an exhibition. A lot of people are watching, and you never know if you're going to get back. You never know if you're going to, if you are going to blow a knee during the regular season and then just never recover. Like, this is your chance to to really showcase yourself. And, and it does matter, I think, narratively when, when they have these moments on a big stage. Uh, but obviously, he felt like it mattered more, you know, playoffs and championship. And I'm sure most fans would agree. Hey, I'd rather see Brandon, you know, actually achieve things that, fans actually care about than than this rising stars challenge so i'm kind of of two minds about this yeah so i was looking back at lamello ball's rising star challenge stat line you can actually find that it's hard but you can actually find the history of the rising stars challenge and i found what he did with team barry when they were you know had a couple of guys also choosing those teams i think mm-hmm. he had eight points he was like three of six from the field from the field so it wasn't a bad stat line it wasn't amazing right but it was something where he put up some fun enough plays i don't remember his rising stars challenge as much I, I'm trying to remember if he was even if he did too, because of course he got injured his rookie season. And so maybe he just missed out on the all star break when he got injured his rookie year. But then he was an all star in 2022. Right. So I guess it, it might have even been the same year that he did rising stars and all stars. We might have had that conversation. But I'm with you, Doug. Like I look. I get what it is for the players. Yes. 
you can't expect me to be at the edge of my seat watching this every single step of the way if the players don't care because I saw Scott Van Pelt tweet it this way and I kind of agree with it. If you don't care, then it's hard for me to. Like, I like the half court shots that roll in. The the dunks are a lot of fun, but it's, I mean, it's pretty terrible, right? Like you're, you're basically watching these guys out there on an open court and then with the team try hard, so to speak, at least they're trying to provide some competitive balance. And I think that's what we're asking for. It's not like I want to see you go all at it, that it's a championship game and you're if you don't win, you're going home. I don't want it to be like the championship atmosphere because I don't want players to get hurt that way. It just feels like, can you go 50 percent? And then the rising stars, it feels like this is a stage for you to just showcase to the world. Yeah, man, I'm that man. I'm that dude. And on a team with Wimby, by the way, on a team with a guy that you're competing with for rookie of the year. And it seemed like he took a back seat. He will. It seemed like he willingly took a back seat. Now, again, I'm not taking the rising stars challenge and like trying to inflate it into something larger about who he is as a player or a person or does he have that dog in him or not? Because we've seen him be really upset with some of these Hornets losses that piled up. We know that the well, at least I think I know that the competitive spirit is there. But until we get to a playoff situation, we're really not going to know for sure where that sort of like crazy competition lies in him. You know, and this was an this was an opportunity to say to 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 look like a player that wants to win everything, that wants to win. That, that, that that's how these some of these insane competitive guys are, like the Kobe's and the Jordans. If they were going to do something, they wanted to win it and they wanted to dominate it. And so this was the first opportunity to see something like from, from see something like that from Brandon, and we didn't get it. Well, and and look, if I told you that he was going to come up with a goose egg, you would have said, "No way, I'm hating." Right? Like, I if right. I, it, there, there'd be there'd be there's a difference. I'm not again the, the whole competitive stuff. I don't, and I'm not even saying you're saying this. It's it's not an indictment on his competitiveness because there are plenty of people in the big old game in the NBA All Star game that just don't right. care that in the postseason go to freaking work, and that's even true in the Rising Stars Challenge. But if I told you, yeah, man, Brandon Miller is going to go over, not going to hit a single shot. He's going to give you like a couple of assists, but he's going to have zero points in this game. Are you excited? Then you're going to be like, no, like I I want to see something more from the only Hornets representation. And that didn't happen again. We can move right on from this post all-star break and be excited as hell that Brandon is ours here in Charlotte, whether you were team Brandon or not, whether you're team Hornet or not, you can look at that guy and objectively say, okay, he is a freaking monster. There's a reason that NBA pundits are pointing to him and say, hey, pay attention in Charlotte because he's the real deal. It's just he had a real chance to say that for himself on the national national stage, and he didn't have a single basket. He didn't have a single point, and that's frustrating. Yes, and and here's where I'm landing on it. I'm kind of figuring this out as we talk about it. All right, so I want to read a quote really quick from Brandon. When he was asked about being selected to the Rising Stars Challenge, and that being something that he wanted to achieve. His answer was, nah, I think my main goal is to win, win with Charlotte, win the playoffs, and like I said, bring back a great atmosphere to Spectrum Center. G- great great answer. And, and, and fa- I saw some fans on Twitter praising that answer. But here's what I thought when I heard that. Man, I kind of feel sorry for Brandon Miller. And I feel sorry for him because I feel like it's not cool to compete on All Star Weekend anymore. No, you're and, right. And he's, it's not <laughs> right. And he's grown up watching the past few All Star games, and and many before that, be ex, be absolute dog bleep when it comes to the effort of players. It's not cool to act like Team Tryhard did. It's not cool to act like Team Detlef did. Okay, and so I feel bad for Brandon because I think he does have that competitive spirit, and I think he, I think if more players tried hard, it would be cool enough for guys like Brandon to come in and say, all right, I'm going to go give it all. But he doesn't want to – I feel like he doesn't even want to look like a try hard. He feels like if he takes Rising Stars Challenge too seriously, people will be like, well, he's not focused on the right things. I just – you know, I, I feel like he – he I feel like he had to give that answer that he gave. And I feel like that's a shame that we focus so much on that stuff that like this showcase this, – the this showcase that is supposed to be about bringing – all of the best things about the NBA into one weekend and showcasing it has turned into a joke.
Yeah. Well, the good news is we've seen him be an absolute dog out there in the regular season right. where in the fourth quarter he shows up and is one of the more competitive players on the roster, like probably the totally. most, at least the most visibly competitive guy on the roster. And I think that's why this fan base has fallen in love with him. It's because he's the one cursing at veterans and rookies alike saying to get back on bleep and defense and transition. And yeah. that that's the Brandon Miller you're going to get again. You're going to get that immediately the first time you see another regular season game. We just didn't see it in the uh, rising stars challenge on any kind of level. Like we just didn't see him take over. We didn't see him care enough to do anything like that. And a lot, a lot of players didn't. So we move on post all-star break. Once the Charlotte Hornets get back in action, we'll still give you some of our takes though. Before then we have a guest coming up, coming up next on the lockdown Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. It was an excellent, intrigued face, Doug. I appreciate you hanging at the Ooh. end of your seat. Evan Damarell, <laughs> host of Locked on Cavs, joins us next to talk about the idea of Mike Ganzi potentially being the next general manager of the Charlotte Hornets. If he was named GM, then what would that mean? We'll get to that in just a moment. Before we speak with Evan Damarell about the new GM of the Charlotte Hornets, I want to tell you this episode is brought to you by Grammarly. No matter what kind of work you do, how you communicate is key. And all those emails, reports, and presentations are equally important to the collaboration needed to get things done. And Grammarly can help. Grammarly is your AI writing partner to help you communicate more effectively and efficiently so you can make a bigger impact at work. 96% of Grammarly users report that Grammarly helps them craft more impactful writing. Grammarly works across 500,000 apps and websites. And by understanding your writing and context, Grammarly provides relevant personalized suggestions. Their tone suggestions help you navigate even the most difficult work conversations. Save time with one click and go from <laughs> editing drafts in hours to seconds. Yes, I said per my last email energy from Grammarly, they'll help you word that a little bit better. 93% of professionals using Grammarly Premium report that it helps them get more work done too. Grammarly is the gold standard of responsible AI with 14 years of experience and just about every IT certification under the sun. Grammarly is a secure AI writing partner that helps your team make their point and move faster. Make a bigger impact at work with Grammarly. Sign up and download for free at Grammarly.com slash podcast. That's Grammarly.com, G-R-A-M-M-A-R-L-Y. Grammarly.com slash podcast. Easier said, done. Go to Grammarly.com. Thanks again for Grammarly. We'll be back with you in just a moment. Coming up next on the Lockdown Hornets podcast, we'll give you the leftover all-star break takes. What did we think about the actual game? Steph versus Sabrina, the dunk contest, all of that stuff in the last segment of Lockdown Hornets. Now we'll talk about some of these candidates that could be the next GM of the Charlotte Hornets. Let's focus on Mike Ganzi up with the Cleveland Cavaliers organization. And anytime we need some Cavs content, we might as well keep it in-house and go to Locked On Cavs host Evan Damarell joining us now on Locked On Hornets. You can find him on Twitter, by the way, for all the Cavs coverage at Am Not Evan. He is Evan with us, though. I don't know about on Twitter. He is with <laughs> us talking Mike Ganzi and talking some Cleveland Cavs. Evan, we appreciate the time, man. How are you? Good. How are you guys doing? We're doing well, Evan. We're just trying to figure out who the GM is going to be. And I, I feel like Doug and I are both on the same page. We like the fact that, all right, you're moving on from Mitch Kupchak. You get a head start. You've got some names that you want to go after. And while Mike Gansey might not be what we think is the favorite to land the job, we do think that there is certainly something here to highlight as far as, okay, if he did get it, then we would be getting some nice things. Overall, Evan, with Mike Gansey being up there, still Kobe Altman calling the shots as the head guy, do you know anything about his role and how he's been able to contribute to a Cavs team that's been able to turn this thing around post LeBron after, of course, he leaves the second time? Well, he does have experience um, running a basketball organization. He was the general manager of the then Canton Charge before they moved it to Cleveland and became the Cleveland Charge, but the, G the NBA G League affiliate of the Cavs. Um, but more or less, uh, just based on the power structure in Cleveland, Kobe Altman is the president of basketball operations, so he does have the final say. But Mike Gansey is still heavily involved with uh, trades, transactions, his biggest demo is scouting and talent discovery, I guess if you want to call it that. He 
was a big factor in the Cavs finding Craig Porter Jr. or Dean Wade or Lamar Stevens in the past. Um, and I think being like a big advocate of the Cavs, utilizing the charges of player development tool. So I think that's just like some of the int- intrigue that comes with him as just like a possible president of basketball operations um, candidate. But at least if you just look at it, his like career timeline, like the, the, him being in consideration isn't a surprise because he has continuously climbed up the executive ladder in the NBA level. And this is just the next step for him. Yeah, so let's talk about that because he, you know, the Hornets have not been the only team that that his name has come up in in these type of rumors. I think around the time that the Wizards were looking for someone, that Gansey's name had popped up as well. And so, you know, when you look at this guy's background, right? He's from he's from Ohio, right? I mean, this is this mm-hmm. is kind of a you know a, a little bit of a, a kind of hometown kid story. Tell us a little bit about that, and then. And then I guess the question off of that would be like, you know, if it is such a great story, him being with the Cavs, why do you think his name keeps coming up in these rumors? I think to start with the last question and go back to the hometown kid story, I think it it does start with the fact that the Cavs do have a bit of a level of success when it comes to their executives. It, It does start with David Griffin building that championship team because Kobe Allman was in the same spot uh, Mike Gansey is in currently at the time when Griffin was running the show during the second LeBron era where Griffin was patient and pragmatic and he knew how to be opportunistic when the time called for it or also just knew how to take a temperature check of a team and then uh, as we all know Griff was let go um, just due to contract disputes and then eventually joined the Pelicans and then Allman took his place and it was the last year of LeBron actually Kobe Allman's first move as Pobo was um, to trade Kyrie Irving, but um, Mike Gansey has then promoted the GM. So I think he's just been kind of paying attention, keeping tabs in the situation. I think he has a full spectrum of understanding, which helps too, because you have the end of the absolute high of Cavaliers basketball uh, in 2018 with the last LeBron year. And then the Cavs to go through a very heavy and hard, heavy and hard rebuild um, with the John Bayline situation, or just, you know, dealing with like the, the multiple years of being, not a great basketball team that eventually turning it around, but I think Gansey scouting helped that a lot too. But on the local level, yeah, he went to Olmstead Falls High School, which isn't too far from Cleveland itself. It's more of like in that gray spot of Northeastern Ohio between Cleveland and Akron. But after that, he went to uh, St. Bonaventure, and then West Virginia, and somewhere along the way developed a bit of a relationship with um, John Bayline, which the Bayline hire wasn't a success for the Cavs in the grand scheme of things. But weirdly enough, um, Mike Kansi's wedding was the catalyst that brought Bayline into coaching the Cavs um, because he was able to connect with Kobe Alvin at that wedding just because of the relationship that Gansey and Bayline had. But I think long story short, it's just, it's always been more of like a player development thing. And also just he, grew up locally and I think you know it is a dream come true to be if basketball is your life like he played basketball at West Virginia and um, at St. Bonaventure as well and try to take a stab at it the G League but if you are able to come back home and live out your dream with what you're passionate about in your hometown I think that's like a dream come true if you're a kid like Mike Gansey I completely forgot about the beeline hire. Like, I just forgot that even happened. Now, he is still married, right? Mike Gansey's still married? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so we don't have to worry about any bad hires via weddings, which is perfect, because <laughs> I don't want that here in Charlotte. I want a good coach that's going to be here for the long haul. Even if it's really hard to decipher what Mike Gansey's contributions are to the Cleveland Cavaliers, because Altman's the head guy, right? It's always tough mm-hmm. when we get the assistant coaches, and we have to really try to figure out what they're responsible for. Overall, what is the Cavs team building structure? What is the philosophy like, whether it be Altman and then help to buy a Mike Gansey? Like, what would you call that for the Cavs and how they've been able to build that team again post second LeBron era? Um, So the structure is interesting. I think everyone has a voice at the table, whether it's uh, Kobe Altman, who obviously, like you said, signs off on the final decisions, but he takes everything into consideration. Mike Gansey as the general manager, um, handling a lot of like the player scouting and things like that, or maybe uh, turning over some stones that maybe the all then didn't see, or you know, JB Bickerstaff speaks within the structure too. Like the coach has a voice at the table saying, like, "Hey, 
I coach like this. I need a little bit more of this from this position or kind of had this in mind. So that like they all are on the same page when it comes to a team building philosophy. And I think when it comes to Gansey, at least um, he has gone from running an NBA D league, then G league now uh, program with the charge. He was named executive of the year at that level. And then just continually kept climbing up the ladder. His general day-to-day responsibility is a lot of it is, um, just doing a lot of player scouting and development and things like that. Even when he was still assistant general manager. And even now, like I have gotten texts from people at college organizations or people who are more affiliated with college scouting saying like, Hey, Mike Gansey's at this big 10 game in the middle of, um, January or something. And then like last year, it was like Ohio state, Michigan was a game. He was scouting quite a bit just because I think if you're a team like the Cavs, you're at the point where can we find guys that maybe are worth taking a stab at in the second round that, we can develop to become cost controlled, cheap role players to kind of support our very top heavy financially team. Or in Gansey's case, during this rebuilding process, he really zoned in on the Darius Garland acquisition or just looking at him saying like, Garland is a guy maybe we should take a little look at or um, Jared Allen, like he's a big advocate for trading for Jared Allen or, you know, acquiring Evan Mobley despite the fact that they had Jared Allen in the draft, like Gansey, kind of has his finger on the pulse of getting hits when it comes to what the Cavs have built. Like those are their three core pieces outside of Donovan Mitchell. And I think Mitchell's the biggest no brainer of the bunch. Like I said, I was, I was not surprised to see Mike's name pop up on the somewhat short list. I think when Woj reported it initially, um, but yeah, Cleveland's executives, whether they stick around internally and keep leveling up in the system and eventually move on. Like I recently spoke with the charges newest GM, Liren Fanon, and she told me, she's like, I'm like, what's, what's the end game for you? She's like, well, I want to be in Kobe's seat. So I think if realistically speaking, unless Kobe Alvin's fired tomorrow, which I doubt, like most of these guys are realizing like, okay, I'm almost at the very edge of being at the end of this. I got to look elsewhere. So I think Michael did, would do a great job in Charlotte. And I think kind of put his finger on the pulse of the culture, get to know the players a little bit too, maybe figure out like who is or isn't a good fit. And also, if he is a disciple of David Griffin or Kobe Alban, he will squeeze as much as possible out of a team for assets just because, at least in their time with the Cavs, every executive within this organization has been patient and pragmatic when it comes to the rebuild. Like They know when to strike, they know when to be patient, but they will acquire assets and use them appropriately to make sure that like it is building towards the final goal which is you know a a hopeful championship contender one day yeah no we're going to need those qualities if we get a gm we would certainly like to have those and it sounds like my gansey could be a guy that would give the hornets that very thing that is evan damarell of locked on Cavs joining us on locked on hornets again if you need any more Cavs coverage make sure you check him out anywhere you get your pods and you can check him out on youtube also on twitter his twitter handle is am not evan evan we appreciate the time man thank you so much thank you both don't go to sleep on the hornets just yet Coming up next on the Lockdown Hornets podcast, we'll give you the leftover all-star break takes. What did we think about the actual game? Steph versus Sabrina, the dunk contest, all of that stuff in the last segment of Lockdown Hornets. Before we do that, I want to tell you this episode is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things just a little bit further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. The 2024 Nissan Rogue is perfect for city drives and great escapes. Class exclusive Google built in is your always updating assistant to call on for almost anything. Gone are the days of connecting your phone. Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store are built right into the 12.3-inch high-definition touchscreen informant system. The 2024 Rogue is the perfect mid-size crossover for your next adventure. Nissan's incredible lineup also includes the 2024 Nissan Armada. Well, it will change what you expect from a full-size SUV. You can picture a rugged 4x4 that can seat up to 8 in first-class luxury and style. You can tow bigger and explore further in the 2024 Nissan Armada. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. That's NissanUSA.com. One more segment to go. Locked on Hornets. 
Before we get to some more all-star break thoughts here, Doug, what'd you think about Evan's takes on Mike Gansey and what kind of GM that he might make here in Charlotte? Yeah, good insight there from Evan about Gansey's role within that structure. And and I think this has already been reported, but if it hasn't, I'll just go ahead and speculate that I think the Hornets are interested in not just making one hire, not replacing Mitch Kupchak with one person like a Gansey or a Langdon, but but developing a structure that I think has been successful other places like Cleveland, where you have an EVP of basketball operations and then under that person, a general manager, because what Evan is hitting on there is that not only does Cleveland have a good player development structure, they have a good executive development structure where Griffin, you know, c- contract issues, he goes to New Orleans, Langdon under him. And then you've got in Cleveland, you've got Kobe Altman moving up to the big seat making the final call on things, but then you've got a general manager under him ready to go in case Kobe Altman decides um, to, to leave for another organization. So you've got, you've got structure there, you've got development, you've got multiple voices in the room. So I wouldn't be surprised if the Hornets are looking to make multiple hires here. And the question is, who is going to make the final call? And if you're going after a guy like Gansey, whether, you, whether you're looking for two or one, you know, Gansey and Langdon are both going to want to make the final call. You know, that's, they're both in situations where they cannot at present. And so part of your sell to them, because look, nobody's going to move from New Orleans to Charlotte or Cleveland to Charlotte. Th- that's a step down in terms of your, you know, just standing situation. So they've got to have some incentive. So maybe money is part of it. But I think also part of it is they get to make the final call. We went through this when we interviewed a bunch of insiders on different head coaching candidates for the Carolina Panthers and even just different general manager candidates where, okay, if it's not going to be Dan Morgan, then who else could it be? But what happens is, especially, especially with the GM candidates, because there's not a lot of bad out there, what we try to do is focus on the good within the organization and feel like that's what they contributed to. And it's really hard to do that. It does not feel like Mike Gansey was just a bystander while Kobe Altman and made mm-hmm. all of these decisions. In fact, Evan, I think, did a good job of telling us, no, he's got a real say. In fact, the Cavalier structure is founded upon everyone having a say and then Altman just being the guy that carries out whatever action they want to have take place there. But he checked off the asset acquisition box. Okay, so they're going to be patient, but they're also going to do something. That's nice. Yeah. There also is somebody here in Mike Gansey that is a good talent evaluator. You're not missing out on the second round picks, the rotation guys that might be there at the back end of your rotation. I think Evan listed a couple of those names, and that's something that we actually had here with Mitch. He did a good job in finding some of those players and then maybe even getting a first round pick in return for some of those players. And you also have Gansey, who remember one thing Evan didn't talk about, but it's because most of us already know is that Mike Gansey played at West Virginia. He was a part of the team that upset Wake Forest in overtime. He had like over 30 in that game. And so he's a player's guy. I wonder if the relationship there, Mike Gansey playing high-level basketball, at least D1 NCAA tournament, Sweet 16-level basketball, gives him some type of relationship with these guys that maybe others couldn't. Now, when you're comparing him to a Trajan Langdon or Elton Brand, okay, that's going to be not even a wash. You're going to get a little bit more from that with Langdon and Brand, who are NBA players, but at least you're not sacrificing it all together. And Gansey, I believe, also had a role within the Miami Heat organization. I think that's right. Maybe I'm wrong on that. Maybe I'm wrong, but I thought maybe Mike Gansey did. Either way, he does sound like a guy I would be cool with, Doug. Like, I, I think Langdon is the one you want to go after. Um, brand we're not fans of just based off of how it went the first time. He's a retread hire. Gansey would be one I'd be cool with. I'd like to see where that ends up if that's eventually the hire. And tomorrow we're going to hear more about Elton Brand because I know he said he's not interested, but the the way to be interested sometimes is to say you're not interested. So we're going to talk to uh, Kai Carlin, who is uh, of the Locked On Sixers podcast, about Elton Brand tomorrow. So mm-hmm. check that out. By the way, Mike's uh, uh, tenure, at least with Miami, he was an unsigned uh, free agent as a player there. So I believe that's his only connection. We got some heat culture. We could bring just a little taste of heat culture. Heat culture, Cleveland culture. I don't care where the culture comes from at this point. We just need a culture. So anyone that can come in here, head coach, uh, general manager, executive vice president of basketball operations, whatever, we need to establish what that is, name what that is, communicate 
what that's going to be. I think that's going to be job number one for this organization. Top down, ownership group, front office, head coach. Let's all get on the same page. Let's emblazon it, what Clifford did last time during his first tenure here, emblazon it on the practice floor wall. Like, what is Charlotte Hornets basketball? Let's go. What do you want to get to first with All-Star break, Doug? First thing you want to talk about, what is it? I think they got to scrap this all-star game, man. I don't think mm. it's working. A lot of people were, you know, replying, <laughs> okay, got to go to USA World, East West. We went back to it, didn't work. Nobody gave a, a poop. So let's go to USA World. That's not going to work either. Like the two guys that cared, I would say the least were Jokic and Doncic, who would be on Team World. So, like, I mean, I get the idea that, like, pitting, especially after all the comments that Adam Silver, commissioner of the NBA, made during the weekend about like USA basketball is falling behind the rest of the world in terms of developing players, in terms of developing defense. And so, like, making a USA versus world matchup would, in theory, on paper, make a lot of sense. But, you know, you've got Doncic out there throwing up three-quarters court shots when there has no chance of going in, when there's 30 seconds left on the clock, like the, the, and Jokic uh, giving up dunks for layups. Like, the, 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 the two guys on the world team that would be your best world players – don't care either so I think they've got to really consider scrapping this thing and moving moving it closer to what Saturday is because Saturday works because it's a bunch of mini games and it's it's not a game and so I think players take it a little bit more seriously it doesn't last as long these little games and so you know you could invest a little bit more of yourself and you don't you're not afraid of like blowing a knee or something if you hit the floor so yeah, I just think we got to get rid of this thing, man. It's just it's it's an embarrassment year after year for the NBA. I don't you know, know why it, they keep running into the wall. But yeah, it like the the problem is they they're successful every now and then, and that's what keeps us coming back. And it's the same with the dunk contest. And so we, when when you have the 2016 Aaron Gordon Zach Levine dunk contest, I mean people have been complaining about the dunk contest long before that. I mean they've been complaining about it. I mean my whole not quite childhood, but once I got to like high school people were kind of over it because all the dunks have been done but then dwight howard gives us this magical dunk contest we're in the superman cape okay we're back in and then it's a little lackluster and then oh blake griffin comes back okay yeah that's the best dunker in the game all right well now we're getting jeremy evans competing and you know jeremy evans who exactly he wins the dunk contest okay now we get levine and gordon you get one every now and then that draws you back in and it's been a while for the dunk contest like Mac McClung was good last year. Mac McClung is not going to be enough of a draw. And this is someone that also people were following all through his high school age and at Georgetown because he was such a freak athlete. But we want to see what the stars can actually do, the best athletes at a star level. And then in the all-star break, yeah, like Elam ending worked a little bit. I remember when Kobe was like saying to LeBron, shoot the last shot when it was a close all-star game, like there was some competition, but you're right, Doug. It's just, it's a whole bunch of, I'll walk and I'll shoot a couple of these three quarter shots. And then, you know, I'll even miss some dunks and that's about it. And it's, it's hard to watch. Like it's yeah. for me, at least it's a hard watch. Well, it's boring. Oh yeah. It, it, you know, you can be, you can be great or you can be terrible to watch. Like people hate watch a lot of stuff. That's not what's happening right now. It has gone into the place that you do not want to go to as an entertainment product, which is boring. And, you know, they were making a big deal about scoring 200 points. No one cares. They just want to see. They don't care about 200 points. They just they want to see a good product. And what was on the floor last night was not a good product. What I th and, and I don't come on here every year and say scrap the All-Star game. In fact, I think this is probably the first time I've yeah. ever come on this show and said scrap the All-Star game. And here's why I say that. Because now the NBA has done what NASCAR did with their whole championship series, which they change it every year, and they change it so much – that it has lost all meaning. Like, it doesn't matter if we compare all-star records now to all-star records even 10 years ago. Like, none of it matters. It has become meaningless, and that is the perfect time to get rid of it and try something radical, try something new, get this TV deal done. I think everything is waiting on this stupid TV deal. Once you get that deal done, all bets are off. Things can change, radically change it. Make it an Olympic-style event where there are so, all these little mini games. And, and if you want to have an all-star game, then do it and make it like three-minute quarters or make it 
two quarters. Make it something so short that you you can have the, the selection and you get an all-star selection because that means stuff to contracts, but shorten the game so that you can have something that is actually a little bit competitive. Make it three on three. I don't know. Get crazy, but do something different because this thing is getting boring and I think people are going to start tuning out. You know, I, I think the three on three stuff, people have been rolling with the one on one. Like it's the exact, but then you run into the slam dunk contest problems because right. if these players don't feel like there's anything to gain, then they're definitely not going to do a one on one comp. Like that would be, it, it was like when Duke played North Carolina in the final four. It's the ultimate trump card. Oh, okay, you're better than me as a player. I beat you one on one in front of everybody. Nobody wants to sign up for that. Not in public. Maybe at UCLA, like Kobe was talking about in a pickup game, but not in the public eye. Man, so, I would I would watch a three v three tournament with that featured NBA players. Let's get some G League All Stars together. Let's get some international teams. Bring some folks over from Spain or some of these other places. The best teams in Euro League. Like let's that would be I would watch that and I think that would be entertaining and I think th that would cause players to compete. So th this is just something off the top of my head. I usually am not like, okay, here's this big elaborate idea type of guy, but something at the top of my head to try to fix the All-Star game. I saw a take from JJ Reddick earlier this year where it was all-star voting season, trying to figure out who was going to get there. And he made the case of just how talented the league is. It, there are like more talented players than ever before, not getting the all-star selection. And sure. the reason that's problematic is because, okay, well, these guys are clearly as good as some of the other all-stars mm -hmm. that have made it in years past. Right. But the league is just so deep and talented. We just need a few more slots. That's okay. Like, it's okay to expand the All-Star game. So, is there a way that you expand it to where, I don't know, you go to uh, however many players you need in order to have, like, a four-team tournament. You play, uh, you play backyard style. You go to 11. And then there's some kind of compensation if you win the championship. So, it's abbreviated. You get more players. It's competitive. And it kind of worked with the in-season tournament. And yeah. so maybe if that's your model, because the in-season tournament worked, like there was at least some level of intrigue to go back to go watch the Pacers and the Lakers to see who was going to win this thing because it was just a little bit different than what a regular season game was. Then I wonder if you could have an expanded all-star roster. You combine, you split them up into like teams of five. You play to 11 or teams of, you know, seven, however many you want to roll with. I guess that's a lot. 28 guys. Yeah, whatever. Or I guess the top 30 make the make the all star team. Right. So if you have the top 30, then you could split that four ways somehow and then maybe host a little mini tournament like that. That's the thing. But ultimately, the only thing they're competitive at, Doug, is the three point contest. Everything else is laissez faire. They don't care. The three point well, contest yeah. is such that you can compete where it's you're not running up and down there's not this fear of injury like all you're doing is going to each rack of balls and then letting them fly and you're doing it where like you're actually getting tired that's what i love like it's the only event that the all-stars get tired in and so can can you bring it to a point where it's abbreviated but it's still high level competition i think that's the only thing the players will go for at anything to max capacity anything close to it well exactly because i think the nba they're out of motivating factors mm -hmm. they tried money they tried charity they tried uh different endings they've tried everything at this point to get these players motivated and there's just nothing you can do because here's the thing it's a long nba season these guys view this as a break and so they're treating it like a break and there's an argument that they should treat it like a break oh yeah because, that's a pretty good one because we've our all of our attention has turned to playoffs championship, right? So that's why I think if you've got to do a game, if you've got to do a game to satisfy, you know, an all-star selection and a team or whatever, <clears throat> that's a fine. Then okay. do that. But but D, what I'm saying is like de-emphasize that part of the weekend and emphasize bring more of Saturday into Sunday and do some more mini games type type of things. That, that they would actually be competitive at, and then we wouldn't focus so much on the fact that the de-emphasized game 
is is not as competitive as it should be you know and, and ultimately uh, yeah right I, I understand everything you're saying too like i just remember last thing for me i remember when it was here in 2019 when the all-star break was in charlotte and i got to cover it so i got to go to everything um i got to go to the dunk contest i got to go to you know every event they put on and that was so much fun but i was thinking about it i was talking about this too with a couple of buddies if you had to choose only one thing to go to it would still be the all-star game because you get to see all of the best players on one court together. Where if you go to the dunk contest now, you are lucky if you get to see Jalen Brown. And then you are probably one of the people booing him in the stands because the dunk contest wasn't good. And so the guys you Jaylen get to see are, Yeah, like all of the shooters. <laughs> while the three-point shooting contest is so much fun. Like I love it. The players clearly love it. At the end of that roster, you have guys like Malik Beasley, you know, so if you're going to choose one event, the all-star game, as far as attendance goes, that's the thing to go to, to see them all live. But of course, we're trying to figure out what to do for TV. And I just want you to make a more watchable product on TV. Like it's, yeah, it's, it's going to be tough. Like the NBA has a hard decision on their hands on how to figure out how the hell do we not make this so painful? The Pro Bowl, look, people just keep watching. The ratings keep on going up. And so it's football. like, all right, nobody people, likes it. People watch, right. people watch exactly. the worst football imaginable right. because right. of football. Right, exactly. They don't have, all right, well, okay, here's some doo-doo on TV. Cool, people are still going to watch it. And Does it like, have a football NBA, on it? Great. <laughs> yes, yeah. Let's go. Yeah, it's hard for Adam Silver to try to figure this thing out, man. Any no, but you, le- you lean into yeah. what works. What worked about yeah. All-Star, well, I, to me, I think what worked is not only three-point shooting competition, but what happened after it. Steph, Sabrina, that whole thing. There yeah, was, sto- was because sick. there was yep. Because there were storylines because there was narrative, because there was comp, there was legitimate competition, and it wasn't hateful competition. It was like two competitors going at it and with respect with one another, and it was a little bit of a mini game. I'm telling you, lean into the mini games. It's more TikTokable. You know, this All Star game is not TikTokable. <laughs> That is that's gonna be in the dictionary in the next two years. TikTokable is is going to be one of the new words added to Merriam Webster's dictionary. That'll do it for Locked On Hornets. Thanks for making us your first listen. Thanks to Evan Damarell also for helping shed some light on what Mike Gansey could possibly do as the Hornets GM. You can catch this anywhere you get your podcast. There's Doug Branson's uh Substack title right there under his name on YouTube, every hornetsboxscore.com. And you can listen to me, Walker Mail, on WFNZ every weekday from 12 to 3 p.m. Have a great rest of your day. We'll be back with you tomorrow.